Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for inviting me to this uh, outstanding meeting. Thank you again. My talk is about strategy of uh, anticoagulation um, before and after catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. When we go to perform an atrial fibrillation ablation, we are like an acrobat on a wire because uh, we can uh, fall on uh, the hemorrhagic and bleeding complication and uh, also on ischemic complication. So this is uh, the first worldwide report on ablation-related periprocedural complication from uh, Riccardo Cappato. And uh, as you can see, we can uh, have uh, uh, bleeding complications like tamponade or femoral pseudoaneurysm or hematorax, luckily very rarely. But we can also have ischemic transient attack or stroke. Stroke are very rare, but are also very important complications. So the first uninterrupted warfarin versus low molecular heparin bridge was written by Wozni in 2007 with better results for uninterrupted warfarin. The first large trial on periprocedural stroke and bleeding complication in patients undergoing atrial fibrillation ablation was the COMPARE study Luigi Di Biasi published it in circulation on 2014. The COMPARE was a very important multicenter randomized trial comparing the uninterrupted warfarin uh, versus interrupted warfarin. And the results were, uh, were very, very important because uh, with an interrupted strategy, uh, Luigi Di Bias and, and uh, uh, co authors, they got a very important reduction in stroke, TIA, and minor bleeding, and also major bleeding complications. So after the compare, the guidelines in 2016 started to to, uh, rec to um, recommend the uninterrupted strategy in atrial fibrillation ablation. And uh, in that year, I started the first controlled trial comparing a new oral anticoagulant and VKA. In 2020, after the new oral anticoagulant trials, we have the new uh, European Society of Cardiology recommendations, guidelines. The first is about the oral anticoagulation before ablation. And uh, uh, the, the anticoagulation before ablation, it's, it is recommended for management of stroke uh, risk. Preferably, the oral anticoagulant should be started at least three weeks before ablation. And this point is very important, I think, because uh, I don't like to perform ablation in naive patients that start anticoagulation the day or soon after ablation, because uh, the maximum bleeding risk in a patient taking a new oral anticoagulant is in the first month. And we learned this from the uh, regist uh, from all the trials for registration of these drugs. The first month is the most risky for the MR, for the bleeding. So I prefer to get the patient one month in a new oral anticoagulant and then perform ablation. Uh, alternatively, uh, the guidelines uh, recommend use of transesophageal echocardiography. Uh, just uh, before the ablation. But honestly, I don't like this strategy. I prefer one month before ablation. And if the patient is in atrial fibrillation, of course, we also perform the transesophageal echocardiography. Um, all, the pa all patients uh, should be um, in therapeutically range with warfarin or on uninterrupted new oral anticoagulants during the ablation of atrial fibrillation. So the uninterrupted strategy today is strongly recommended with the class one and level A of evidence. So very strong recommendation, the uninterrupted strategy. <clears throat> 
What about after the uh, after the atrial fibrillation ablation? The, all the patients uh, have to continue the anticoagulation for at least two months, and the long term is related to Charles Vask score. If the Charles Vask score is uh, one uh, or more than one, they should continue. On the Charles Vask one, we can discuss uh, uh, later. The first uh, randomized trial comparing new oral anticoagulant rivaroxaban versus warfarin was the Venture AF. In the Venture AF study, uh, the bleeding and ischemic complication during it soon after the atrial fibrillation ablation were very, very low. The second uh, published study was uh, the uh, study on the uninterrupted dabigatran versus warfarin, the recirquit study. In this study, we randomized, we randomized more than 600 patients. And again, the thromboembolic events were very, very low, no events in uh, uh, the bigger run in the group. The minor bleeding were very similar between the bigger run and warfarin group. A huge difference was recorded on the major bleeding events. In fact, the, the bigger trend got uh, an, uh, just 1.6 bleeding complication, major bleeding, and the uh, warfarin 6.9. So the bigger trend ensured a, a relative risk reduction of 77% and an absolute risk reduction of 5.3%. So this result was. Uh, really, really important. The apixaban, uh, as uh, the previous trial, uh, was compared with the warfarin, and the major bleeding uh, were very close to the warfarin group. And, but this study uh, shed, uh, again, other lights on the, on the problem of the uh, cerebral lesions, asymptomatic cerebral lesions. They were very well studied. And uh, all the patients uh, performed in this group, in this subgroup, in this sub study performed the MRI. And uh, as you can see, a very high percentage of patients had at least one lesion, 16, uh, two lesions, 4% uh, of patients, more than two lesions, 6% of patients. So, also in DK. This is a, a problem. We don't know what uh, happens to cog cognitive function. In these studies, they didn't demonstrate anything uh, about the impact of cerebral lesions after ablations on cognitive function. But of course, these studies are, sh are short-term studies. We are going to publish a new paper on this topic. And what we have seen with the, these co-authors is that the acute brain lesions were not associated with the cognitive function at three months after ablation. But we observed that an association between chronic white matter damage and the lower MOCA scores were found. So, a patient that had the chronic white matter damage had an impairment on cognitive function. So this seems to be related more to the uh, situation of the patient, of the patient, general situation of the patient, and much less related to atrial fibrillation ablation uh, lesions. Also, the uh, doxaban was compared to warfarin in the eliminate AF trial. And again, they found, we found a lot of cerebral lesions. This is our uh, meta-analysis. And in all this study, as you can see, uh, about 15% had a new silent cerebral thromboembolic event soon after the atrial fibrillation ablation. It is a little bit scary uh, percentage, 15%. Uh, we also studied uh, uh, this uh, kind of trouble when uh, we perform a first man study on the new catheters. And uh, usually we use uh, uh, 325 seconds of anticoagulation or even more. 
And as you can see, uh, increasing uh, the ACT required during ablation uh, led to a reduction, led to a reduction of thromboembolic events. But, but we also found thromboembolic events in patients with the uh, very high level of anticoagulation, even in patients with the level all uh, over more than 300. You see this patient between 300 and 400. We also, in this kind of patients, found sometimes microcerebral lesions. This is related uh, to uh, something different from thrombus formation because uh, we may have uh, a cerebral, uh, very small cerebral lesion from a very small uh, coagulum after the ablation, from tissue damage, from a steam pop, for instance, from charring. You see charring on the tissue, but also charring on the electrodes. This is a charring close to the uh, circular catheter. Uh, electrode, but also charring related to air bubbles. And this is, I think, a very important uh, method because sometimes we, we try to increase and increase uh, uh, the ACT, but uh, we don't reduce the charring risk increasing the ACT if the risk comes from air bubbles. This is a, is a cadaver lab experiment, and, the one, and uh, I'm pushing a balloon catheter quickly in the long sheet without increasing the saline. The saline is going to two milliliter per minute. So slow, slow flow, but quick insertion of the catheter. You see the, cat the balloon catheter go inside the left atrium in the lab, but soon after a lot of air bubbles come out. And some air bubbles are really big. See again? how big are these air bubbles coming out of the long sheet. And this is because I didn't increase the flow rate. Usually when we put the balloon-based catheter, but any kind of catheter inside the long sheet, we increase the flow rate of uh, a parinesis saline from two up to 45, 60 milliliters per minute. In this manner, we increase the pressure inside the long sheet and it becomes impossible that air goes into the long sheet, just increasing the flow rate during the insertion of catheters. Uh, some uh, group try again to speak about a reduction or uh, uh, skip some uh, uh, anticoagulant before ablation. And in this uh, study, with a little bit more than 300 patients, you can see that they performed ablation in the, the first group uninterrupted, the second group single skipped dose, third group 24 hours skipped. Uh, again, the number of uh, uh, major bleeding and ischemic events were uh, very low, but I want to point out this. This is the amount of heparin that uh, they needed to uh, give to the patients, infused to the patients. See, with an interrupt, it was around 20,000, because you know that with the new oral anticoagulant, we need much more heparin when compared to uh, warfarin. In the group with the single skip, they gave more than 20,000. In group with 24 hour, more than 22,000. So what I mean is that uh, if we have a patient with uh, an high chance vascular and with persistent AF, uh, with a large atrium or hypertrophic uh, left ventricle, it may be very dangerous to skip one of 24 hour dose of neuron coagulant. And this is the same when we are when we want to stop our anticoagulant after ablation. This may be very risky. There are publications in which uh, they demonstrate that uh, we can stop our anticoagulant after successful ablation. But I'm afraid. I want to see some randomized big trial on this topic. Because when we stop abruptly the new oral anticoagulant, we increase a lot the risk of uh, stroke. And this is a, a registry from a Liana group. And you see that uh, in the first weeks, 
we have uh, something like 15% of the scam event because we have something like a rebound effect. So I, I don't feel safe telling you that we can stop our anticoagulant if the chance fast score is over than two, like some uh, paper is, going to, is publishing. I want to tell you that we need a large trial to demonstrate after successful ablation if we can stop our anticoagulant. And uh, this is uh, the plas plasmatic dose of uh, oral anticoagulant during ablation. Usually the ablation is performed in the morning. And uh, as you can see, when we take a, a single dose, once day oral anticoagulant, we are going to work in a, a low plasma, plasma level. When we work with a, with a twice daily anticoagulant, new oral anticoagulant, we work in the peak plasmatic dose level. Luckily, today we have the either Chizumab for the dabigatran and the Nexen et alpha for the other neural anticoagulants. The either Chizumab is a, a very, very useful drug, but honestly, I never used it because uh, sometime we had in a couple of patients uh, an effusion we stop heparin, we revert heparin with protamin, but we never use uh, either Uchizumab or Andexane. So my suggestion is at the beginning, uh, uh, revert heparin and wait, observe the patient. This is uh, the comparison of all the study, just to tell you that the new oral anticoagulant, uh, they have uh, a good forever uh, effect when compared to BKA implementing uh, stroke and major bleeding. You see the stroke are very, very low in this study and major bleeding uh, is better in neuroanticoagulant when compared to VKA, especially in the recirculate study. And uh, this is my last slide, just to tell you that uh, uh, I like the, the title that uh, Joseph uh, told, uh, gave me, before and after ablation. Before ablation, uh, please start anticoagulation at least three, four weeks before ablation. During ablation, it is very important the anticoagulation, but also the workflow with the optimization of sheet management. And uh, after ablation, I think it is very important not only the chance fast score and or anticoagulation, but also the control of other uh, risk factors like hypertension, uh, sleep apnea, diabetes, and the lifestyle. The body mass index should be taken in a very important uh, uh, concern from uh, the physician to the patient. Thank you for your attention. Hello from Ann Arbor. It's a pleasure and honor to be here and give this presentation at this meeting today. I thank the organizers for the kind invitation for me to give this presentation. I'm going to talk about anticoagulation after ablation for ventricular arrhythmias. Talking about trouble prophylaxis post ablation starts with assessment for thrombi prior to ablation. Pre procedural imaging is key to enhance procedural safety and to improve outcomes. With respect, to, echo, to the echocardiography, I cannot overstate the importance of sonographic contrast to rule out cardiac thrombi. CMR um, is also used to assess for scar location and to rule out cardiac thrombi. And CTA can also be used for assessment of wall thinning, cardiac anatomy, and to rule out cardiac thrombi. This short and long axis view of a CMR um, study highlights a patient who has an a, a, a laminar um, um, thrombus in the basal part of the inferior wall in an aneurysm as highlighted by the short axis view on the left and the long axis view on the right of the red arrows. This thrombus was not visualized by 2D echocardiography despite the use of uh, contrast enhancement. This um, thrombus base um, visualized by a long axis view on the CMR appears more fragile and 
it's key to be uh, noticed during uh, prior to the ablation procedure. I, I, if you miss this thrombus, you can do whatever you want. Um, post ablation with anticoagulation, this patient will be in trouble during the ablation procedure. This is a um, uh, long axis view of uh, CTA on the left and the corresponding view of the MRI on the right showing that the thrombus can, cannot really be assessed well with the CTA on the left, but can be easily um, identified with the CMR on the right with the um, um, highlighted by the uh, red arrows. This is the short axis, corresponding short axis view, and you can not see a thrombus on, on the short axis CTA versus you can see the thrombus clearly on the short axis MRI view. Um, we use multimodality imaging in, in all patients prior to ablation procedures or in most patients and looked at the value of CMR, CTA and contrast enhanced echo in 154 consecutive patients with structural heart disease. Trombiver identified um, in, by CMR in nine patients, by CTA in seven patients and tr by transthoracic echo using contrast enhancement in only two patients. You have to be aware of this limitation um, of transthoracic echocardiography. When talking about mapping and ablation and anticoagulation, we use a very simple um, protocol. Um, we start with induction of VTs at the beginning of the procedure. No matter whether they are tolerated or not tolerated, we map and ablate in SCAR. And then when we think we are done, we induce VTs again, and hopefully we think we are not inducible anymore, and that's the end of the procedure. We use heparin for, um, with, an, with a target ACT of 250 to 300 seconds. We also perform focal ablations in post-infarct patients, like in this 85-year-old male with prior infarctions and recurrent VT storm. The patient was refractory to amiodarone and maxillotine. Um, and you can see here the, the tracings during sinus rhythm, where the catheter is and shown in the, in the, in the bottom um, tracings, where the mapping catheter is in contact with the scar, and you have a nice late potential um, there. When we pace from this side, we have a very long stimulus QRS interval, um, and the morphology matches actually with the morphology of the patient's ventricular tachycardia. And you can see that there is isolated potentials during diastole. When pacing is performed, um, you have concealed entrainment with matching stimulus QRS and electrogram QRS intervals. This was the effective ablation side. This patient was non inducible after ablation, um, and we only gave this patient aspirin for. Um, um, Thromboprophylaxis. Extensive ablations post infarct can be, but also in other structural heart disease, can be considered if there are no tolerated VTs that are inducible, clinical VT is not inducible, or there is extensive scarring with many inducible ventricular tachycardias, or we cannot perform program stimulation because of safety concerns. In this particular patient, um, the, he had 20 different VTs documented on his ICD recordings, we could induce only four, and therefore we ablated the entire um, scar. Now, the post-procedural anticoagulation uh, regimen depends on the ablation, the extent of the ablation lesions. For focal ablation, we use platelet inhibitors, and for extensive ablation, we use either vitamin K inhibitors or NOAX. The definition of an extensive ablation is an ablation um, that has lesions extending for more than three centimeters in length, and this was used by the Thermopool study. We have reported on this in a few years ago um, in, in JCE 2018 using this protocol where um, we use um, heparin with bridging after an extensive ablation procedure. We remove the sheaths after pro prodamine administrations, and eight hours after sheath removal, we start unfractionated heparin, six to 900 units an hour uh, for, 600, for six hours and start um, warfarin at the same time too. If they're, and these are all manually um, um, compressions used for uh, retrograde access in the majority of the patients. There's no bleeding. We advance the dosing of the heparin um, to weight adjustment and then increase um, subsequently to reach an, a, um, a PTT of 50 to 70 seconds until an INR of two to three is reached. Um, if people um, 
have no bleeding and uh, we, we allow them to have Lovenox uh, 48 hours after sheath removal, but give only half the dose of Lovenox until they reach a therapeutic INR in order to discharge them from the hospital. Anticoagulation is continued for three months or longer if there's another indication for anticoagulation present. We have done this in 217 patients. A localized ablation procedure was performed in 33 patients. Those people had only antiplatelet um, medications, no embolic events or bleeding occurred in these patients. An extensive ablation was performed in 181 patients with bridging anticoagulation, bleeding occurred in 11, and a thromboembolic event occurred in one patient. This is the anticoagulation spectrum that we use. In the majority of patients, they were on warfarin and a single antiplatelet agent, but there were also patients with warfarin and dual platelet agents. These are the indications for anticoagulation. Number one indication was the per, uh, history of atrial fibrillation or persistent atrial fibrillation. LV extensive ab LV ablation was the second most common indication. Then patient had LV thrombi, history of LV thrombi, or LV aneurysms, or had a mechanical valve or an LV assist device, or had a history of PVT and, um, and PE. The recent expert consensus document from HRS that was published in 2019 included some of the data highlighted in, in, our, um, in our study um, as a 2A recommendation in less extensive ablation um, uh, for VT ablation, antiplatelet um, um, agents um, were considered as reasonable and heparin reversal with protamine was considered as reasonable. A 2B recommendation uh, um, was considered um, as might be reasonable for extensive ablations and heparin bridging also considered a, as a potential consideration with the concern that there may be some patients who have periprocedural bleeding. More recently, we were more interested in NOACs and closure devices to enhance, the, um, to speed up the, the, the post-ablation process and get the patients out of the hospital because of the fast onset of uh, anticoagulation then with warfarin and the e they are easier to take obviously than warfarin. And the closure devices, arterial closure devices reduce the risk of bleeding and hematomas if a retrograde approach is used. And we had the aim to compare previous our previous anticoagulation protocol of manual compression in warfarin versus NOACs where we used an arterial closure device for retro um, great approaches. Um, we had um, 30 um, patients, consecutive patients in this protocol where we used the retrograde um, approach, which is our preferred approach and NOACs. And compare this to the historical um, um, group that I outlined in the protocol I talked about earlier. Those people had more hematomas than the NOAC and arterial closure group. They had an equal amount of clinically relevant thrombo um, um, thromboembolism, namely zero. However, their hospi the hospital stay in the patients with arterial closure and NOAC device was substantially less than in patients who underwent um, manual hemostasis with warfarin. And this was also true for the length of stay post ablation. Withman and colleagues recently pointed out um, the prevalence of asymptomatic emboli after the ventricular arrhythmia ablations in 18 patients who had brain MRIs before and after their ablation procedures. 12 patients had LV and six patients had RV ablation procedures, targeting an ACT for LV procedure three to 400 seconds. Aspirin was used in most patients. Most of the patients, 58% with LV ablation had embolic events on um, brain MRIs versus zero in the patients with RV ablations only. Most of the patients undergoing a retrograde approach had embolic events. All embolic events were asymptomatic and all procedures were performed with a cultural smart touch, thermocool catheters, and clear whether it was a surround flow or not surround flow because the surround flow uh, smart touch catheter is known to be associated with an increased prevalence of thromboembolic events. Lucky Reddy and colleagues recently um, presented their data at the AHA a year ago of their stroke VT study where they randomized patients after VT ablation to DOAX and aspirin, 52 patients. Um, they performed brain MRIs 12 hours post ablation, 30 days post ablation. 
and assess for symptomatic embolic events and asymptomatic cerebral embolizations. Um, there, um, had, there were 26 patients in aspirin and 26 in the DUAC group. Their groups, however, were quite unequal in that the DUAC group patients were older, they had longer procedure times, they had longer ablation, um, uh, ablation times, and they had more frequently a transeptal approach. Nevertheless, um, they had less acute um, asymptomatic um, cerebral embolic events acutely and at, at one month, and also um, numerically less um, embolic events in forms of TIA that were more frequent aspirin. In a multivariate an analysis, asymptomatic embolic events were associated with a retrograde approach, longer procedure times, long ablation times, and aspirin um, therapy. More recently, uh, Boris Sinkova and colleagues from the group from Prague published their um, data on the impact of access routes for VT ablation and asymptomatic brain injury in 142 patients that were randomized um, post um, were randomized to transeptal versus retrograde um, LV approach. Um, the brain damage was assessed with, a, with the rise of a biomarker S100B that's only uh, exists in the brain. Uh, rise of more than 30% to the baseline was considered to be um, indicative of brain damage. Brain injury occurred in 19%, and the rise of this marker occurred more often in patients randomized to retrograde approach as compared to a transeptal approach. Not everything that looks like a thrombus is actually a thrombus. We recently published on this in Jack Imaging, um, pointing out that ablation lesions that we call dark core actually um, look like this. Um, what you can see here in the short axis MR view from, from, from the base in an apical direction, you can see these dark areas highlighted here in, in, in orange sitting on top of the, of the skull that's shown here in, in blue. And this is a patient who actually had an ablation procedure two years earlier and um, intracardiac echo did not show any clot in this patient. These are some other um, dark collisions um, from prior ablations uh, highlighted by the arrows in yellow. Our current approach includes after an extensive ablation, we use protamine for sheath removal. We use direct closure of arterial puncture. Um, if we did a, trans, a, a retrograde approach using percolus or angiocele versus manual compression, depending on patient's factors. We initiate NOAX as soon as four hours after sheath removal with direct closure of an arterial puncture and retrograde procedures. We initiate um, heparin eight hours after sheath removal when you use manual compression and initiate warfarin versus NOAX post ablation. In summary, um, pre procedural assessment for LV thrombus is key to prevent peri procedural embolic events. After an extensive VT ablation procedure, systemic anticoagulation with vitamin K inhibitors or NOAX for a limited time has been safe in post infarction patients. Asymptomatic brain injury is observed more often in patients undergoing VT ablation using a retrograde approach. Direct closure of arterial access sites followed by anticoagulation with NOAX, after especially an um, retrograde approach, appears safe post ablation and may reduce hospital. Uh, may reduce post-procedural hematomas and reduce hospital um, stay and uh, length of stay after an ablation procedure. NOAX may reduce asymptomatic embolic events. This completes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Richard Schilling from London, and I've been asked to talk about same-day discharge in patients after catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. We face a number of challenges for AF ablation in Europe and around the world. Uh, the first is that demand is high and increasing. There are limited numbers of experienced centres that are able to deliver this therapy, and there are limited healthcare resources and overnight beds available to all of us. The other challenge is that AF is a low risk condition and therefore any procedure that we do must be equally very low risk indeed. 
So how do we make this a quick overnight procedure or day case procedure by minimizing the risk? Here you can see what we all know, which is over the last 10 years, there has been a gradual and slight increase in all cardiovascular procedures. Demand for PCI has been increasing very slightly. However, uh, all ablations and specifically AF ablation has been increasing in volume by a significant amount. And we know that we are just touching the tip of the iceberg in terms of need and demand. Similarly, uh, AF day case ablation is an increasing necessity because overnight bed availability is decreasing. These are data from the NHS showing over the last decade, the number of beds that are available uh, as overnight stays in both general and acute, which are the dark blue lines, and in maternity and learning disability and mental illness, which are the fainter bars at the top. And if you focus on the dark blue lines, you can see that there's been a steady decrease as we've been building new hospitals to have them with fewer and fewer overnight beds in an effort to improve efficiency and decrease cost. And if we look at the next slide, you can see that this trend is mirrored across Europe. So in this bar chart, you can see data from various European countries showing the trend to actually decreasing overnight beds over the last few years. And these are data from between 2012 and 2017. There are a number of advantages for day case ablation. Uh, the first is it's easier to staff and we all are finding it increasingly challenging to find nursing and non-medical staff to help us do these cases. And having no overnight shifts is a great attraction uh, for employees. They're cheaper to run uh, because you don't have to run three shifts. You can only run one shift in order to do a day case procedure. And more importantly, the beds are predictable. The beds can be ring fenced and therefore not occupied by emergency missions coming in through the emergency room. And this is particularly prescient in times of winter flu crises or indeed the COVID crisis. The, the final thing is that the team can be ring fenced to just deliver these types of procedures and therefore may perform better than they would do normally. The disadvantage and concern that's raised over day case AF ablation, however, is the issue of complications and specifically late complications. The other challenge is finding beds for early complications. Most day case procedures are done in a hospital, so there is always the opportunity to transfer the patient. However, that may be a challenge if beds are filled and under demand. However, I'll be showing you some data later on of procedures done in a day case only facility with no overnight beds at all. The other problem is that the use of operating room time may be limited by recovery time, because of course, after you've finished your procedure, you then need to plan for a two to four hour recovery for the patient afterwards. So setting up your day case recovery area so that it runs at least three to four hours later than your operating room is important, which may mean the operating room is not used as efficiently as it could be normally. It does also potentially put a greater burden on community care because you may be relying on GPs, general practitioners or family practitioners locally to help you support the patient in the day after the procedure. We also know of healthcare systems where there are perversing financial incentives to keep patients overnight. You will get reimbursed a higher rate for the patient staying overnight than you will the day case, even though the cost to you is almost the same other than the cost of the overnight bed. And we know that AF ablation, the highest cost, is hidden within the disposables and the technical equipment rather than the staff and the beds. So the first thing to think about is how do we minimize complications for this? And this probably covers uh, or is encapsulated in four key issues. The first is making sure that your technique is as safe as it possibly can be. When you've chosen your technique, it's very important to be consistent with your approach because it is not just the operator that's doing the procedure, it is the entire staff around them 
And if they are not familiar with what you're doing, particularly if you're doing relatively low volumes, it will be very challenging for them to deliver a slick and smooth experience for the patient. Staff experience is important, so the staff need to be able to know and understand what they're doing. And having a consistent approach and the same staff delivering it will help build their experience very quickly. They don't need to be particularly skilled and experienced at the beginning. They can be trained very quickly as long as they're doing the same procedure over and over again. And then finally, patient selection, making sure that you are picking patients that have a good chance of early and rapid recovery and a lower chance of success, uh, of complication. So which techniques should you use? Well, point by point with skill can achieve great results. However, it does have the disadvantage that cavitation with the radio frequency energy is possible, resulting in a tamponade, no matter how good the operator is. And catheter and sheath perforation is more likely than if you're using a balloon. However, if your main experience and skill is with point by point, then this is clearly the technique that you should use. However, I would, use, I would argue that balloon-based techniques are less dependent on skill, and there are numerous data that have shown this, and less dependent on experience. It is more able, possible to get a consistent outcome with these technologies than it is with point by point. It, however, it is important to remember that using the mapping wire can still uh, allow perforation if it's not used correctly. Pushing the mapping wire out of the balloon when the balloon is up against the wall can make the mapping wire perforate the, the myocardium. And so it's important to handle that wire appropriately. And it is also important when you're doing particularly the transeptal puncture that you move the sheath in an appropriate way so that it doesn't penetrate the appendage. So the technology options are radio frequency point by point, Q dot high power short duration, cryo balloon or RF balloon. And I would suggest that the uh, cryo balloon is at the moment my favorite technology, but others will use other things that they're more familiar with. Here's what I described earlier with um, more than 21,000 procedures in the Helios registry, showing that cryo balloon is independent in terms of its complication rate, uh, independent of the operator and the center volume and experience. As I've said already, however, whatever you're comfortable with, make sure that you use that and focus on prevention of tamponade, avoiding stroke by using uninterrupted anticoagulation. And this is um, how I would uh, suggest the transeptal puncture can be done safest. The first is to use ultrasound guidance, either with intracardiac echo or transesophageal echo, to be sure that you're transeptal sheath is on the septum. One thing that has revolutionized my safety and technique is the safe set guide wire, which has helped me to avoid left atrial appendage perforation. The safe set wire is a, a very thin wire that can be used to perforate the intraatrial septum. If you go into the wrong place and withdraw the wire, it's so small, it will not cause a significant bleed in my experience. However, more importantly, what it allows you to do is to advance the safe set wire up the left upper pulmonary vein so that if the sheath jumps through the septum, it will not be directed into the left atrial appendage and potentially perforate that. It will be guided up the left, left upper pulmonary vein and avoid that perforation. The radio frequency needle is very popular, uh, particularly in the US, and it does prevent tenting but it does not avoid you over advancing the sheath and potentially perforating the appendage. Here is an example of a X-ray showing the safe set wire. It has a J on the tip that is not radiolucent, however, uh, that is not radio opaque, but you can see the tip of the shaft of the wire as a black line in the left lung field. And by seeing the wire in the left lung field, you know that that wire must be up one of the pulmonary veins. There is no other way it can get to that position. And therefore, at this point, it is safe to advance the needle and the sheath through the septum, knowing that you cannot perforate the appendage. The consistency of approach is very important. In our 
practice now, we insist on femoral access always being used, uh, always being guided by ultrasound, which has really lowered our complication rates um, from false aneurysm and unnecessary hematoma. No subclavian lines are implanted, so there is no risk of pneumothorax, and no arterial lines are implanted, so there is no problems with radial access, and this speeds up the whole procedure. Early mobilization has been described in a number of studies, and this is my preferred technique using a Z suture with a three-way tap. The advantage of this is that it's more comfortable for the patient than having some pressure device pressing on the leg. And the advantage of the three-way tap is that the patient can be mobilized, the suture loosened, and if the patient has a re-bleed, it can be retightened again using the three-way tap without having to have a nurse press on that groin for another hour or so. So this is a very efficient way of getting the patients up and about and being con confident that they are not going to have an early re-bleed. Experienced staff are not required. They can be trained and rehearsed uh, before they start the service. Um, but if they are um, doing the same procedure every time, um, then they get very good at the procedure very quickly, particularly with recurrent rehearsal. It is also important to rehearse emergencies like tamponade because they will happen extremely rarely, if at all. It is important to consider femoral problems and make sure that your recovery staff understand how to mobilize the patients. And it is also important to address patients' concerns by warning them about chest pain, warning them about early AF recurrence, so they are not ringing you every hour after they've been discharged, telling you about these things because they already know and expect them to happen. Patient selection is important. So I would always suggest selecting patients at low risk of post-op respiratory problems. Make sure they have someone at home to take care of them and someone to take them home. And although obesity and frailty is not a contraindication, it can make early mobilization more difficult and increase the chances of femoral complication. Similarly, underlying structural heart disease is not an exclusion for us. Uh, we are just aware and careful about that. So when starting with your program, um, always think about the patient's complaint uh, with risk reduction. Uh, choose paroxysmal AF patients who are going to have high success rates so that your referrers are supportive and confident of your service. Avoid patients with high, with, pick patients with high symptoms and low risk so they get great outcomes and are a good advert for your service. And make sure that you pick patients who are able to comply with your instructions and considering engaging your referrers. So well, I will ask my referrers to do the follow-up on the patients so that they can see what a great service and outcome they're getting. And it also means that the patient doesn't have to travel up to your center for a specific follow-up. So it imp increases your referrals. These are data from a non-surgical center and you can see the outcomes compared to the regional cardiac centers are exactly the same in 276 case co match cohort um, comparison. From a non-surgical center, the procedure times are lower because the patients are having the procedure done repetitively by the same team, and the fluoroscopy uh, times are lower, and the complication rates are lower. From a day surgery center with no overnight beds, you can see that these are early data. We've got 4% admission rates with a 64% paroxysmal um, AF rate, so only 30% are persistent. The challenges of groin mobilization, early mobilization, avoiding antiplatelets and NOx combined obesity, and using the suture overnight if patients are continuing to get ooze. Other things to consider are using a short acting general anesthetic, which allows quicker recovery, and putting the local on the uh, puncture needles all the way down to the femoral vein and using no ACT because the procedures are very short. Um, other concerns about day case ablation, well, late tamponade is late, it is very rare. Femoral re bleeds are rare, and most centers do these procedures without cardiac surgery cover. So in conclusion, day case AF ablation is feasible and safe. It is a necessity we have to demand, adopt because of increasing demand and COVID, and particular attention to standardization, training, and elimination of minor efficiencies will get the best out of this approach. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much uh, for having me this year at the Prague AFIP Symposium 2021. And thank you for Professor Kausner for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be uh, here with all of you this year online. The task that I've been assigned is a stiff LA syndrome, a consequence of ablation or induced by atrial fibrillation itself. And these are my disclosures. So when we think about the ablation goals, the ablation goals are maximize the success, but also reduce complications. And, uh, you know, we all know the possible complication of an ablation from the most common, the access site bleeding or hematoma. In the past, we had a lot of PV stenosis, thromboembolism, cardiac perforation and tamponade, esophageal injury, phrenic nerve injury, skin injury, others. All of them are really going down in all trials and in the experience of all of us. But there's something that still remain after an AFib ablation, which is the dyspnea after an ablation. And when we think about that, what should we think about? Pulmonary vein stenosis, occlusion, pulmonary embolism, left atrial tachyarrhythmias, phrenic nerve injury, pulmonary hypertension, pericardial effusion with or without tamponade, congestive heart failure of fluid overload, others. So I think just to keep us in mind, which of the following information should be most helpful when formulating a diagnosis for the cause of dyspnea? I think it's important to remember the type of ablation that was performed, either radiofrequency or cryo, to guide us versus phrenic nerve versus no phrenic nerve, the anticoagulation strategy that was utilized, the timing of onset of the symptom and the extent of the ablation that was performed. As we all know, phrenic nerve injury or palsy can follow uh, an ablation, radiofrequency more common with the phrenic nerve and can cause, you know, as we know, uh, dyspnea. And we know because there is an anatomical relationship with the, the phrenic nerve in, and the left atrium. And uh, this is, you know, the diagnosis that you can do at the um, X-ray. But timing of the symptoms for dyspnea is variable. It can be a stenosis, as I said, a pulmonary embolus, a lethal tachyarrhythmias, or a pericardial effusion plus minus tamponade. It's important that we look at the report of, of the prior ablation. It was a simple PVI. It was an antral PVI, it was an extended ablation, it was an uh, left appendage electrical isolation. That also matters for the symptoms that the, the patient may have, which is dyspnea following an AFib ablation. So, you know, it's important that, you know, we obtain all the possible information that we need for our patient that come with up with the with the dyspnea and we do we we have you know the recording we have an electrocardiogram we have a ct scan we have a, a nuclear stress test but what else can we consider we should never forgot or forget the stiff left atrial syndrome we published this paper in 2011 it's almost 10 years today I'm co-author here with Dr. Gibson, co first author, and Dr. Natale is the senior author of this paper. It's a, a relatively newer recognized complication of a ablation characterized by dyspnea, congestive heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, LA diastolic dysfunction. In 1998, Snyderman and colleagues reported a patient who presented with dyspnea, cough seven years after mitral valve placement, there was no evidence of prosthetic valve dysfunction. The patient was found to have left atrial diastolic dysfunction. A subsequent similar patient presented and coined the concept of stiff left atrial syndrome. And the fourth report of dyspnea and associated diastolic LA dysfunction after ablation was reported at the Script Clinic in San Diego in 2008. It's important that we differentiate from pulmonary hypertension that is defined as a resting mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 25 millimeter of mercury at rest and more than 30 during exercise, according to the ACC, 
other mechanisms leading to pulmonary hypertension post radiofrequency ablation include pulmonary vein stenosis, rarely pulmonary embolism, and LV diastolic dysfunction. Uh, the LA diastolic dysfunction is me measured as large V waves recording on the pulmonary cuff wedge pressure or LA pressure tracings in the absence of significant mitral regurgitation. Large V waves in a PCWP tracing are generated as blood flows via passive filling into a non compliant left atrium during the LV systole. The significance of the V wave of the V wave is related to any pathological condition that would affect atrial filling during LV systole against closed atrial ventricular valves. So it's important that we, we talk about these large V waves that are seen infrequently in condition other than severe mitral regurgitation, which was absent in the series that I present. And uh, therefore, the V waves is impaired compliance of the left atrium that is less likely due to scar. It's important that detailed assessment of LA compliance is not a component of the startup pre-ablation assessment. The effect of prolonged AF on LA function is poorly studied, and it's possible that AF alone or other factors such as advanced age may contribute to altered LA compliance in some patients. However, the progression of symptoms after elimination of AF argues against this. If pre-existing impaired LA compliance exists in common conditions such as advanced age, long-standing AF, and diastolic dysfunction, it is important to determine whether LA ablation causes further deterioration and should be a consideration in patient selection. So this is an example of LA pressure before ablation and after ablation. The smaller positive deflection at the beginning of the V wave may be seen and appear to be the results of mitral valve closure and the resultant small volume of blood that is displaced back into the left atrium. And again, large V waves here following the ablation. In this other paper, three patients have been reported. Uh, this is uh, Jack, 2011, was a little bit after our, our series. And uh, large V waves were defined as seven millimeter of mercury greater than the mean pulmonary wedge pressure. And uh, LA hypertension as a mean pulmonary wedge pressure of 12 millimeter of mercury. So patient one was 68 year old women who underwent focal echal tachycardia and crystal terminalis ablation. LA, LA tachycardia ablation, PVI isolation, lateral septal mitral annual ablation, PVI and superior vena cava isolation in 2004, patient two, PVI, third PVI, isthmus, LA posterior and septal wall debarking, patient three, PVI, linear ablation, superior vena cava isolation, and repeat PVI in 2008. On presentation, it each patient had echocardiographic evidence of elevated dry ventricular systolic pressure, 65, 48, and, and 48. And uh, records were available for each patient documenting no significant elevation of right ventricular systolic pressure before his or final ablation. No evidence of PB stenosis, LV systolic infunction, mitral valve disease was found to be the cause of elevated right ventricular systolic pressure. A right heart catheterization demonstrated large V wave, waves with a mean pressure wedge, pre, uh, pulmonary wedge pressure increased from 17 to 33, from 6 to 13, and from 11 to 18 in each patient, respectively. The V waves increased from 31 to 50, 56, 13 to 26, 19 to 36 millimeter of uh, uh, mercury. Thus, all three patients share the distinctive feature of large unexplained V waves on positive wear pressure tracing that were further accentuated with volume loading. And these are the example patient one, pre and post, patient two, pre and post, patient three, pre and 
post, as you can see, the large V waves. Then we go back to our series that was done on 1,380 patients, and these are the baseline characteristics. These are all the patients that had the syndrome. I will give you the incidents that we reported. And uh, which were the predictors in our series? Obstructive sleep apnea, diabetes, a small left atrium, high LA pressure, and severe scarring in the left atrium at the index procedure. And you can see here that these were the predictor, the predictor, predictor of this uh, complication. The incidence that we reported is 1.4%. So this is important to remember that this is not a big complication, but maybe an under, underestimate based on the limitation methodology of study. Patients were identified by symptoms. It is likely that normal pulmonary venous vascular compliance protects against PA pressure elevation and severe symptoms in many patients. LA pressure tracing were taken at the time of ablation. Echo assessment, not enough tricuspid, uh, not enough TR signal, and limitation of measurement of atrial systolic function were in our series. Detailed assessment of LA compliance is not a component of standard pre-ablation assessment. The effect of prolonged AF on LA function is poorly studied, and it is possible that AF alone or other factors such as advanced age may contribute to altered LA compliance in some patients. However, the progression of symptoms after elimination of AF argues against this. What's the management? Diuretic therapy. Some patients developed a New York association class three dyspnea that returned to class one post-diuretics. All patients had symptomatic improvement after diuretic therapy. And uh, this is the effect of diuresis. You can see the pressure here after diuretic therapy in the series of uh, our heart rhythm paper of 2011. Other consideration, the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension did not differ between AF type. Ablation protocol for paroxysmal versus persistent and long-standing persistent were different. The APTL systolic function was preserved is more in most cases. This is important observation because it suggests that the diastolic abnormality is the primary condition resulting in the hemodynamic observation and no related to abnormal atrial systolic function. So in conclusion, there are several different complications that can cause dyspnea in patients who are post radiofrequency ablation of atrial ablation. Stiff lepatrial syndrome is a potential complication after atrial ablation, ablation. sleep apnea, diabetes mellitus, small left atrium, severe late atrial scarring, and high LA pressure predict patients who can manifest this syndrome. Awareness of the stiff levator syndrome may help assist clinicians in recognition and treatment of this syndrome, especially after other causes, causes have been excluded. Diuretics have demonstrated symptoms improvement for patients with stiff levator uh, 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 syndrome, but other medications approved for pulmonary hypertension have not been studied in patients presented with pulmonary hypertension post radiofrequency catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. I would like to thank all of you for the attention to my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josef, for the kind invitation to this uh, PREX symposium on ablation strategies. And it is always nice to be um, invited as an expert on complications. Um, I just take it uh, um, as a compliment and try to educate you on esophageal lesions and monitoring and what we can do to potentially prevent thermal injury to the esophagus. These are my disclosures. Having said that, we have an esophagus problem 
in, with current available ablation technologies, as all of them are thermal. Atriosophageal fistula is the most feared complication, and it implies a direct connection between the gases um, lumen of the esophagus on the one hand and um, to the left atrium on the other hand, which may, means that air might get into the mediastinum and the left atrium, um, leading to severe neurological complications and usually inflammation and potentially also bleeding complications. HSFG fistula has been documented with any thermal ablation technologies, and so far over 140 cases of HSFG fistula are published. When looking into the incidence of HSFG fistula, we have learned from large surveys that the incidence may be around 0.02%. But when looking into more real life data with consecutive follow up of all patients, like in the Leipzig, or in our cohort, you can see that the incidences dramatically vary and are much higher, approximately five to 10 times higher compared to the reported incidences in surveys. So when you look at the mortality of esophageal fistula, and I have to admit that some of these uh, surveys also included esophageal pericardial fistula, which have a much lower mortality, you can see that the mortality is around 60 to 100 um, percent, thereby indicating that this is a most fatal and dramatic complication of a uh, of a procedure that treats a um, that treats a disease that is not life threatening at least. The incidence of H. esophageal fistula has remained stable over the last years, as indicated in this report from a French survey, including almost 80% of all AF ablations in French. Um, despite technological modifications like contact force or thermal probes in the esophagus, there has been a consistently but low incidence of H. esophageal fistula. So the occurrence of H. esophageal fistula is not prevented by using esophageal temperature monitoring or modifications of thermal ablation technology. The mechanism of atrial uh, esophageal fistula is directly related to mostly acute direct thermal impact to the esophagus. So this means that during ablation, you can already see some thermal injury in uh, endoscopy if you would perform that on the same at the same time. On the other hand, after creating the direct thermal impact, there is progression which is related to the thermal damage of the periesophageal nerves and vasculature, increasing also acid reflux and inflammation, which may lead to progression from esophageal uh, thermal ulcers to, um, to atriosophageal full grown out fistula. We're not sure if we can prevent the progression of thermal injury related to atriosophageal fistula, but we can identify the acute thermal injury, and that is by doing post ablation endoscopy. If you see a picture like this with a, a nasty looking esophageal ulcer one day after an AF ablation procedure, you can imagine that this is something that may relate to progression and may potentially lead to uh, fistulation into the left atrium. Um, and that is why we and others have focused on these endoscopically detected esophageal lesions or EDEL um, that can be investigated and can be compared as they are much more common than atriosophageal fistula, and they can be compared when modifying ablation strategies, ablating uh, ablation methods, and uh, it is better to rely on these more common complications compared to waiting for an atriosophageal fistula. With our gastroenterologist, we have uh, categorized these adults as either being mild which would be these erythema erosions or small ulcers less than five millimeters from category two lesions 
which are ulcerous lesions larger than five millimeter in diameter. Just keep in mind that all of these um, injuries that you can see during endoscopy indicates transmural thermal esophageal wall damage as they are transmural burns. The most important reason why categorizing um, these esophageal thermal injuries is indicated in, in our experience um, on over 2,500 patients undergoing post ablation endoscopy after a first AF ablation procedure and to have completed at least three month follow up. As you can see, 13% of these have thermal injury uh, related to the ablation um, procedure. 80% of them are actually mild category one lesions, whereas um, the rest are category two ulcerous lesions. In total, 4.3% of the overall cohort have ulcerous category two lesions. Now, if you look closely during follow-up, only patients who have category two ulcerous lesions actually progressed towards perforating esophageal complications like atrioesophageal fistula, esophageal pericardial fistula, or esophageal perforation that were effectively treated with covered esophageal stents. So our notion is that reducing the incidence of esophageal thermal injury may decrease the risk of relevant esophageal complications related to AF ablation and makes the risk for atrioesophageal fistula comparable when modifying approaches. Um, we have used multiple techniques and technologies for ablation of, atri uh, of atrial fibrillation. And you can see the incidence of thermal injury, ulcerous lesions, or esophageal perforating complications in this uh, busy slide. I just want to address that right now, using high power short duration or very high power short duration, the incidence of thermal injury to the esophagus and ulcerous lesions is the lowest compared to other ablation strategies. So we are on a good way. Now, the second question in my presentation is actually, what is the role of temperature monitoring? We have uh, evaluated temperature monitoring for quite some time before completely abandoning it. So this is, um, this is an initial uh, study that we performed and in these patients, we use the temperature probe in the esophagus and stop the ablation when we reach a temperature of 39.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, but we, uh, we did do endoscopy in all patients who had a luminal esophageal temperature of 38.5 degrees or higher. So when looking at the results, you can see that high temperature in the esophagus is related to a higher incidence of thermal injury to the esophagus, even though it does not imply that low temperatures indicate no lesions. So it can only be stated that the higher the temperature, the higher the risk probably for esophageal thermal injury and esophageal severe ulcers uh, is included. We have then done some comparative studies using the Sensiterm. You may know this. This has three non-covered uh, thermocouple probes uh, that are positioned in the esophagus. Um, and uh, we have compared different radio frequency ablation technologies in either using the probe with a temperature cut of 39.5 degrees stopping ablation or in, uh, in the other group, not using any esophageal temperature probe. And what you can see is consistently throughout all of these studies on radiofrequency ablation, the incidences of thermal injury to the esophagus is higher if using this specific probe. So uh, that's why I would not recommend to use this. Um, the circa probe is a different probe because it has insulated coated temperature sensors, 12, uh, 12 temperature sensors that, are, uh, that cover most of the esophagus um, and they do 20 measurements uh, per second. And as, you, as indicated when comparing uh, 
using the probe, the circa probe, or not using any probe, there appears to be no difference in regard to the incidence of esophageal thermal injury. So it does not worsen things, but so far as there is no clear cutoff study for this specific probe, um, we don't know um, if it has any benefit. And this has been uh, this has been summarized in this uh, diagram. Uh, when using discrete temperature sensor probes, either the circa probe or the sensor term probe, you can see that patients who have a negative endoscopy and those who have a positive endoscopy um, are pretty much uh, overlapping in regard to their maximum measured temperature. Um, as you can see down here, the differences, the, me the mean difference of maximum temperature is around 0.5 degrees Celsius. So these discrete temperature sensor probes were unable to discriminate between endoscopy positive and negative patients. There were patients who had no temperature increase but still had thermal injury and vice versa. So um, having said this, and uh, there is a current uh, published manuscript on a meta-analysis of all studies looking into post-ablation endoscopy. And as you can see, most of this, uh, this uh, meta-analysis is actually driven by some of our studies, this one, this one right here, and this one. And there appears to be no effect in regard to thermal injury to the esophagus when using discrete temperature probes. So the problem with all these probes, and I think that is uh, something that is crucial to remember, is that all of these probes have a high degree of latency and a high variation in thermal timely response um, to in temperature increases. And if you look just at one of these, some of these probes, you can see that it takes in between four to seven seconds until there is a one degree temperature increase um, documented on these probes. And you can only imagine that this is not helpful if using high power short duration ablations. So we have been investigating a different probe, an infrared thermography system, which is currently not available, but I think it offers some important insights into the mechanism. This is a, a probe that spins up and down six centimeters in the esophagus in a tubing, and it rotates 360 degrees so it does close to 8,000 temperature samples per second. And what in this first study, the heat AF study, what we did is actually, we performed our regular ablation pulmonary vein isolation approach and not looking, being blinded for the temperature readings of this probe. So this was more or less used as a cutoff study to evaluate what temperature will indicate what incidences of thermal injury. This is an example um, of the temperature readings of the probe. Red indicates 50 degrees Celsius or higher. And you can see during ablation uh, at the posterior left, in, uh, left pulmonary vein region, we were ablating point by point. And you can see how the, the heat maximum actually travels while moving the catheter and we, we performed endoscopy and saw a strand of thermal injury in this patient. Now, if we look closely, you can see that there are, there are short hypes of temperature increases that reaches up to 65 degrees maximum. There is some heat stacking, so it does not get back to completely normal, but you can see how fast the increase and decrease of temperature actually is when using an infrared system for uh, monitoring the esophagus. As a result of this study, and these are the patients who have a negative uh, endoscopy finding compared to those who have a positive finding, there is still some overlap in maximum temperature or peak temperature measured on the infrared thermography system. But what you can see is the mean is 10 degrees difference. So there is a significantly higher temperature, a mean temperature in patients who had a positive endoscopy finding, so who had thermal injury to the esophagus, 
And actually when applying a cutoff of 50 degrees Celsius, uh, we had a negative predictive value of 97%. That means if we did not reach 50 degrees Celsius on the infrared tomography system, we, need, we only saw one patient with a thermal injury, whereas 50% of patients who had a 50 degree or higher temperature reading on the esophagus actually had also thermal injury. So this means that maybe we need something else and pulse field ablation is something that needs to be discussed in this regard. Um, there have been reports so far that there is no injury related to pulse field ablation during AF ablation. In clinical cases, 29 patients underwent endoscopy and no, uh, no thermal injury was documented. And there is also a study on 10 animals where deliberately it was attempted to perform esophageal lesions uh, by ablating close to the esophagus with using pulse field ablation and compared to radio frequency ablation. And there were no thermal injuries related to pulse field ablation where all patients, uh, where all animals who had RF ablation actually had severe uh, thermal injury related to the ablation. So in conclusion, HSFG fistula occurs with various ablation modalities, has been stable over time, can occur despite SFG protection measures, and is not related to operator experience. It's just a matter of statistics. Thermal injury to the esophagus measured on or detected on um, endoscopy is actually common after AF ablation and category two lesions may, the, they may be the ones who progress to perforation and approximately 10% of these lesions may progress to perforation. Esophagy temperature monitoring may allow risk stratification but currently available discrete sensor probes fail to discriminate between endoscopy positive and negative patients. And last but not least, I strongly believe that there is glory in prevention. So if we could prevent HSFG fistula from occurring, this would definitely be glorious to the AF ablation um, strategy. Last but not least, my last uh, slide, as always when talking about esophageal thermal injury, is I'd like to remind you that we have an esophageal fistula hotline, which is the first worldwide hotline where in an online format, if you have any problems related to uh, AF ablation based in induced thermal injury, um, this will be a web contest and a contact and Philip Sommer and myself will answer as soon as we get to the, these emails and generate and help you um, in any comprehensive measure to treat these patients. We have a team of expert EPs, expert enter gastroenterologists, expert imagings, and cardiac surgeons. And so if you have a problem, just try to contact us and we will help. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have a panel discussion. I would like to thank to all speakers. Uh, I'm very happy that I see them at least uh, at a distance on the screen. And uh, I hope that uh, next year we can meet uh, personally here or somewhere else. So let's start uh, discussion. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience. So maybe we will start in the sequence uh, how the lectures went uh, uh, one after the other. So I have uh, questions for uh, Massimo. If the patient has Chatswask uh, zero, uh, do you really need uh, anticoagulation before the ablation or, or just uh, starting uh, after? And the other question is if you have uh, if you have PV isolation and there is pericardial effusion which is delayed, so what would be your anticoagulation strategy? How it will be modified if you have this complication like four hours after the ablation? Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you for inviting me. About the first question, of course, also if the patient is a Chatsvask zero, 
I always prefer to anticoagulate at least three, four weeks before. Guidelines suggest three weeks. I prefer one month. But this is also related to the registrative studies about new oral anticoagulants. In all the studies uh, for all four new oral anticoagulants, the first month is the worst one. We have the higher risk of uh, hemorrhagic events, of bleeding. Uh, so in this window of time, we can understand if that person is at risk of bleeding and uh, that person starts, um, um, the, the organism, you know, knows better the drugs and uh, reach some equilibrium. So, and it, this is uh, very important. If you start the new oral anticoagulant the day of the ablation or, or the day after, it, it, it is even worse, uh, you risk, I think you risk a lot because you don't know how that kind of person will uh, respond to the drug. So I always prefer at least one month before ablation and guidelines strongly suggest three, at least three weeks. About the second question, uh, if we have a, a late pericardial effusion, um, it depends. It depends on the patient. It depends on the amount of pericardial effusion. Uh, if it is uh, uh, just an effusion, 100 cc, uh, nothing important, we continue the, the drug, but we take a strict monitoring of the patient, very strict monitoring with pressure, continuous pressure, and we will strict uh, monitorize the, the, the patient in the, in the department. Of course, if the, uh, we have uh, uh, an higher amount of effusion, uh, I think, to 300 or more cc of pericardial effusion, we stop uh, the uh, oral, new oral anticoagulant and we observe. Uh, we don't do not, nothing more, we just observe. If it becomes uh, important, if it becomes a tamponing, but it, honestly, I never had this kind of uh, late uh, tamponing, of course, you need uh, you need to do a pericardial synthesis, but usually we just observe and we stop the oral anticoagulant only if the amount of effusion is uh, more than uh, two, three hundred. Oh, I, I forgot to that. introduce my my uh, co-chair here, uh, Dan Wichtel, so I'm sorry if yeah. he has some questions or somebody else's comments from the panel. Joseph. Joseph, this is Luigi. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yes, I agree with, uh, for the two questions, the Massimo answered, I agree with him 100%. There are actually some, some preliminary study here that they are trying to go from four weeks to two weeks only for low charts. I know that in daily life, some people don't do that, but uh, on big numbers, I think uh, that the safest thing is to do the four weeks uh, or three, at least three weeks. For uh, an information I wanted to give, because we talked about the late effusion, but if you have an uninterrupted case and you have a tamponade, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, we have reported a few cases of using the K-Centra rather than uh, the direct uh, reversal agent for uh, Eliquis and uh, Xarelto, uh, so the factor 10A. It works very well. It's much cheaper than uh, the Andre uh, Andexanet. And I truly recommend uh, uh, to use that uh, before going for the more expensive one. Uh, of course, it's off-label use, but uh, it, it's, uh, it works very well. And uh, you only need to be careful not to use too much protamine uh, when you use that, because that K-Centra contains itself some uh, reversal agent from the heparin. So you don't want to over-treat the patient with uh, uh, protamine. Joseph, maybe um, yep. just Thomas Denica. Hi, Joseph. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I got I got a question to Massimo because in Germany, every once in a while, it happens that a patient with a low chance vas just gets to your hospital and gets his ablation the next day, and he's not anticoagulated. So, what would be the best strategy for this patient? Just put him on Noax, do low molecular weight heparin. Uh, what would you suggest, Massimo, in this in these cases where you just start ablation one day after the patient is admitted to the hospital? Uh, 
Hey, thank you, Thomas. We never use the low molecular because um, uh, all the studies show the um, no good safety profile of these drugs for uh, um, ischemic and, uh, of course, hemorrhagic events. We always prefer to give a new oral anticoagulant one month before, but if they come to the hospital, as you say, and they are not, they are naive, not anticoagulated, we prefer the dabigatran. We prefer the dabigatran because we have either chizumab, it is very fast, and because it showed the best results in the real life trial. Um, so uh, we, we do the bigger Thomas, Thomas, I mean, uh, I, I know that in daily life, and I said it before, you don't have to, but AFib ablation is an elective procedure. Uh, if it happens in Germany, you can actually discharge the patient and reschedule him at a later time because you don't need to do that ablation that day. And you can do this in safety. The fact that you have done 100 and you didn't have any problem doesn't mean it's safe. It's just a matter of how many patients you have treated. If I had to recommend that you really have to do it, I truly recommend to do a, an ablation that is limited to the pulmonary vein only. So small time in the left atrium, get out, treat this patient as a WPW, where you go, we don't anticoagulate the patient with WPW, we go inside, we do a couple of lesions, we get out, we, and you can discharge the patient on, on a NOAC for uh, some time. Okay, thank, thank you for your comment. We have to move on to uh, Frank Bogun's uh, talk. Frank, I, I have, uh, there is no question from uh, the audience, but I have a question for you. If you start to anticoagulate patient after extensive ablation, as you nicely documented, how long you continue? If there is no other indication like AF or, or uh, uh, some other indications that are like a prosthesis or whatever? We have done the, um, the, the, the protocol that was also outlined in the thermocool study. Um, for three months, but we have now, we do now less than that. We now do, do it at least for one month and then we reassess the situation. So we are thinking about cutting down, especially when we use NOAX. And I know that you are using also intracardiac echo. Does it influence your decision whether to continue even longer if you have uh, smoke-like echoes in, uh, in left ventricle? Because sometimes you see that the blood is just not flowing properly. So for us, this is the main indicator of risk of thromboembolic events. We have not used in intracardiac echo findings to determine uh, no. length of okay. anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. well, what about um, anti-grade and retrograde approach? You mentioned, and we have also this one study showing that uh, if you do retrograde approach, you probably can expect about double of uh, this uh, silent emboli. <clears throat> then uh, does it influence your uh, strategy, for instance, for us now, if the patient is old, uh, you know, some comorbidities or frail patient, we always go now uh, transeptal rather than going retrograde. Because I prefer also retrograde for for VT ablation, but uh, in general, I I must uh, admit that uh, that I change my uh, strategy depending on risk factors of the patient. Yeah, I think it's important to uh, individualize the approach. And if you have patients who have um, the, asc the ascending aorta on, on ultrasound looks like there is there is um, increased wall thickness and the, the aorta doesn't look quite right, then you use intracardiac ultrasound. If you use it for every, every patient, then you may change the approach to a tra uh, transeptal as opposed to a retrograde approach. Okay. So mm. they, I have one more question to Frank. Uh, do you consider extent of ablation in, um, for anticoagulation? Because sometimes it is very extensive ablation, sometimes it is almost focal ablation. So Yes, yes, exactly. We use, we use the, um, an, uh, if there is a line of, of point, to, point to point ablation lesions that's more than three centimeters, we, we use the, that as an indicator for prolonged and anticoagulation as opposed to uh, using antiplatelets, which we use for more focal um, ablation procedures. So if the ablation lines are less than three centimeters in length. And that's that, that, that is some um, empiric, um, you know, 
measure that was brought up by the by the or suggested by the thermocool study that we have just um, used for our practice. Okay. Thank you. There's no other. There's no other science behind that. There was a question for, from Thomas Deneka. I I saw that he raised uh, his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I was just uh, having the same thing in mind. So when would you consider something being extensive versus limited? Do you have a, a duration of our or is it just the distance that you cover but i think you answered it already sorry so okay can we can we move to richard Schilling's talk it was a great talk for me very very nicely structured uh, i have one question for for you from the audience what is proportion of day case ablations or other ablations at bards um so it is pretty much 90 to 95 percent day case now um, even the radio frequency ablation is usually discharged home uh, later that evening. And if you, if you do it uh, in the afternoon, so they go home later evening, yes? They go home later evening, but some of the cases I was describing in the last few slides are in centres where there are no overnight beds. So we're now doing AF ablation in a centre that has no access to an overnight bed, even if you needed it. It was uh, interesting that I, I watched the AF symposium and I uh, learned from US experience that uh, COVID actually changed uh, the game and, and rules and uh, many patients are now uh, discharged the same day, but they even use uh, some devices to, to close the venous access to, to speed up the recovery and send patient home, they, which of course brings uh, some extra cost. So do you have any experience with some closure device for veins? Yeah, so we, I use the per close device for a while, but I think they're quite difficult to use well because the vein is quite fragile and if you put it too tight, it doesn't work as well as it should do. So I've reverted to use, using the Z suture because it's much cheaper. I mean, the US is an interesting case because uh, all of the day case ablation in the US is largely done in hospitals. Mm -hmm. Texas is a unique situation where I understand that they do have standalone uh, day surgery centers doing it because of the COVID emergency code. But, um, that may, I don't know whether that's going to change across the US, but certainly in the UK, I think people are going to start looking at doing this in a pure day case facility. It is also important to mention that it depends on reimbursement strategies. Uh, in, in our country, we, we still have discussion with insurance companies to promote more uh, day cases, and they somehow try to refuse uh, to, to have this... Uh, uh, you know, complex uh, uh, ablation procedures to be like one day cases. So we, we have to change it uh, because yeah. this makes so, sense. Joseph, also, I mean, in US also, I mean, the cost is an issue, but uh, I think, uh, you know, the way the administrator may understand the relevance of, uh, you know, of this uh, device of the vein is lab time because you can push the, the patient out of the room very quickly and ambulation time. With some of these devices, you can ambulate the patient about two hours after. So if the patient can stand up, even after an extensive ablation, uh, you can basically avoid putting a Foley, you can put the patient to walk after two hours, probably discharge the patient. I just want to the audience because this same day discharge is becoming popular. And I feel that people need to understand that same day discharge can happen, but only if you have a structure. Dr. Schilling showed it very well. You need to have somebody that the patient call, you need to be able, if you don't have the structure, patient should not be discharged after a fib ablation. I think we need to say these things because a few of us have the structure to do that, but not everybody have the structure to do that. I fully agree with your comment. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very good uh, comment for closing this, uh, 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 let's say, part of the debate. And then I have questions for you, Luigi. Do you think that LA occlusion can contribute to stiff LA syndrome because of reduction of reservoir function? No, absolutely not, because we, uh, we experienced this complication in cases where the appendage was not uh, uh, even ablated at all. 
So uh, I don't think that uh, that's the reason why you can experience stiff left trunk syndrome. It's hard to diagnose it. So many, many of you may have experienced that and the patient come back and say, oh, after the procedure, I don't breathe well. And you do, and you do all the tests and everything is negative. Well, now, if, if you would have done probably the positive pressure tracing, you would have understood that. So I don't think it's, it's absolutely not an appendage isolation that caused that. Actually, if you see the presentation, a, a predictor of that is a very small left atrium. And when you have a very small left atrium, usually you have paroxysmal AFib, usually you do a simple PVI. So actually, it's, it's, it's really the way the anatomy of the patient is. The, and, uh, you know, there are some predictors that are sleep apnea and diabetes. The reason why you may experience that. Yes, extensive ablation is another reason, but extensive ablation means roof line, means a lot of other things, not appendage isolation. I, I'm surprised that in your analysis there was no, um, let's say, no factor like obesity because uh, from our studies we know that if you have BMI more than 40, then absolutely everybody has increased uh, uh, pressure in left atrium even before ablation. So after ablation usually there might be some more increase because of uh, edema and less uh, reservoir function, let's say. The, the question is super appropriate. Well, you know, Obesity lost its significance at the multivariable analysis, was still good at the univariable analysis. Probably is the combination of sleep apnea and obesity. We, lo we lost, you know, I, I presented the one that were, uh, were, were positive, the multivariable analysis, but obesity is really there. So I agree with you that obesity, it's a, a risk factor. It just didn't come out from the multivariable analysis. There, there is a question of uh, Massimo and Tomas, please. Luigi, I know that uh, we are studying electroporation. Do you think that electroporation with less amount of fibrosis after ablation will reduce the risk of uh, stiff left atrium? Uh, it probably will. I am concerned. I mean, we all love electroporation. Uh, I'm concerned about the opposite, about in not having stiff left atrium, but <laughs> having, you know, uh, deflated left atrium, like, because they may be prone to dilatation. This is something that we need to, to study better because you lose, you know, muscular contractility by doing electroporation. So I think that's something we need to, to face in future. Mm. Okay, Tomas, please. Yeah, Luigi, just one short question. Do you see a relation also to the number of prior ablations or is it only the extent? There is a relation also to the number of prior ablation, but uh, again, I don't think it's, you know, the number, it's, it's the extent of the ablation that can happen in one or in two or in three times. There are people that burn a lot one time. There are people that stage their extent of ablation in the left atrium. So it's a combination of both. Okay. Uh, I have one more comment uh, to Luigi. Uh, it is well known that uh, V waves are much larger during, uh, usually during slow sinus than let's say, a little bit faster atrial fibrillation. Uh, might it be a reason that some patients are, uh, uh, feels uh, better in uh, AF than in sinus? Uh, I really don't think so, because when we treat, when we have, I mean, it's a good comment, but when we have treated this patient with the diuretic, once that symptom has gone, the patient have felt much better in, in sinus. So uh, then when they were in AFib, so I, I don't think that uh, patients feel better in, in AFib than in sinus. And I mean, in my personal experience, every patient that goes from long term history of AFib to sinus feel much better in sinus. I, I don't recall any that has the opposite. All right. Okay. So we have some questions for Thomas. Uh, is there any data on the rate of progression of esophageal lesion or ulceration to fistula? I, I'm afraid that there are no data, but maybe you have more uh, data from your experience. Well, th thank you, Josef. Yeah, w w what we've seen is that we've only seen severe esophageal complications in patients who have had thermal ulcers after the ablation. So there is a relation between the initial 
injury to the esophagus and the progression. Um, and it's, uh, it's well, we, we have modified our approach to, to these patients who have relevant esophageal ulcers because we just, uh, we just treat them differently now than we just, we do not observe them anymore, but we just keep them on fasting and everything. So we try to modulate the progression, but um, it can be that, any, uh, that anywhere in between one out of 10 to one out of 20 out of these severe ulcerous lesions may progress. So th there is one question uh, here. I highlighted that if you have any preferred protocol to reduce the risk if you have these ulcers, like uh, using proton pump inhibitors, etc. Well, we, 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 always those pro we always use proton pump inhibitors, even though there's no proof it really helps. It just makes, the, uh, makes us feel good. Um, and, and what we do is if we have an ulcerous lesion like that, we keep the patient in hospital. We rescope them every two to three days until we see a regression of the initial size of the uh, esophageal ulcer. And we keep them until this day, we keep them on fasting either completely or only on, uh, on liquid uh, fasting. So that's, that's our protocol. Um, and by that, well, I think we've done everything we can so far and we've seen, uh, let me address this. So if, if any of these patients have, um, have either pain during swallowing or get fever or anything, we would, uh, we would put them into the CT to see if there is progression to perforation. And we would be very, very early in using esophageal stents in these cases. Um, if we see a non-fistulous perforation. Uh, Joseph, we, we have uh, uh, data, uh, I mean, I don't think there is an answer if uh, 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 an erosion or, uh, you know, uh, gastritis-like uh, 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 lesion will, will go to, into a fistula. I don't think nobody has this data. We have a little different data and that, you know, these things recover over time and they not, not always you know, progress to fistula. I think uh, this worrisome for all of us because we have really no way to, to, to predict or to understand that. But in our experience, we have done several GI study. I published a paper in 2009 with a capsule endoscopy where we had a lot of uh, positive findings. None of them went into a fistula. So I'm worried that it's more an apoptosis like, uh, you know, problem where there are some patients where something is activated and uh, it's hidden until it manifests. And if you have something that you can see after the procedure, doesn't mean that that will be a fistula. So personally, I will feel very uncomfortable in treating this patient with uh, a stent uh, before, uh, you know, the, I'm convinced that it's progressing to a fistula. And I feel that stent are less uh, um, less useful than really closing the 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 the, the damage with the cardiac surgery well, well well not for a fistula i mean in a fistula there is no other way than going for surgery you have an early detected esophageal perforation this is something that may be covered with a stent or we we've also seen two patients now We've had a perforation uh, that without any manipulation of the esophagus, but only on fasting, actually um, healed off. So these, these are patients, and I completely agree, not all of these, uh, of these severely looking ulcers actually progress, but there are some, and we really have to learn why these progress. And that is, I think that is the, the key question. It's really hard. I have one question. Is pain a good indicator or simple indicator of uh, overheating of the esophagus when you do ablation without general anesthesia? I remember that there were a few studies, I have one of them from Linz, uh, showing that if you have general anesthesia, you have higher risk of uh, these uh, esophageal lesions. So what is your uh, view or opinion? Well, the Again, a tough question, and I don't have a good answer for that. We, we do all our patients on proper full sedation. 
Um, and so depending actually on the deepness of propofol sedation, they may, uh, they may react to pain or not. So it's not something we have consistently been evaluating. But of course, the esophagus is moving away from, from heat as a, as a potential um, initial uh, thing. And um, so, I mean, maybe this is something that happens in general anesthesia as well, that the esophagus is just not as motile as during sedation. Maybe um, so, there is also reflux uh, during uh, general anesthesia, which can contribute. Exactly. Which I think the reflux is more a problem in the days and weeks after the procedure. Uh, but but let me just address the, the pain sensation because we've seen all of these patients who have severe looking esophageal ulcers are pain free, and I think this is one additional part because we're not only uh, we are not only heating up the esophageal wall but anything that is around the esophagus as well, vasculature, nerves, which which leads to the progression and decreases healing of potential damage to the esophagus. So there's multiple things that actually fit into this Luigi picture. Luigi has comment or question? Yes. Uh, in, that, in that paper, I was telling you about the capsule endoscopy post-ablation. We compared general anesthesia with uh, sedation. And yes, there, were, there was a higher number of people with a positive lesion in the general anesthesia that was at the beginning in US in 2010. And, uh, uh, but we kept using general anesthesia because we, we find out that these lesions were higher because probably less saliva, less uh, reflex, as you were saying. But, you know, with proper, you know, fluids in the body, none of these lesions went into a fistula. So we co currently use general anesthesia. So for sure, yes, there may be higher lesions, but they don't cause fistula. There is because also... there are a lot of fistula also in sedation question oh. regarding uh, cryoablation uh, richard nicely showed that for less experienced people they they uh, if they use uh, cryo it's uh, safer so what about the fistula and cryo well has been presented with cryo as well i think any thermal uh, ablation mode will lead to thermal damage of the esophagus it's just a matter of statistics and that's why i really hope for uh, for pulse field ablation. Um, and I think right now it looks promising. We just have to wait intensively. I, I have to confirm this because we have experience with the other system that you mentioned, the Farah Pulse, and we have experience with Afera, which also uses, uh, um, <clears throat> you can use uh, pulse field ablation on posterior wall, uh, you ablate on esophagus, and there is no rise of temperature practically, and uh, there are no lesions uh, when you do uh, endoscopy next day. I mean, th this, this may be a really game changer. Um, so we we have to wait, but there is a promise of kind of revolution in EP, especially for AFIP ablation, I believe. So, if you if we have no more uh, questions, uh, there, there are a few more questions, but that that would prolong the discussion. I, I think we are just in time, and we have to uh, close this session and debate. Uh, I would like to thank again to all of you, friends, for uh, uh, taking invitation, for having nice lectures, for being with us for discussion. And uh, I hope that we will see each other uh, in person very soon or next time in Prague. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, Josef. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.